Hello, everyone, and welcome to How I Built This video edition. How how are you all doing today? Um, week six, I think, for a lot of us um, who have been uh, shut in um, and, and locked down. So I hope you are staying safe and at home. We are here to talk about building resilience, and we're taking your questions right now on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube for Samin Nostra. This is Food Week. All this week, we've been talking to incredible chefs and restaurateurs about all the amazing things they're doing. Um, before we get to Sami Nostrat, I'm so excited about this today. I just briefly wanted to thank Comcast Business for supporting How I Built This and NPR during this time when we really need uh, their support. So thank you. Comcast Business is prepared for times like these. They're powered by the nation's largest gig speed network to help give you speed, reliability, security, and the tools to manage your business from any device anywhere and a team of experts 24 seven. If you wanna find out more about Comcast Business, go to comcastbusiness.com. We couldn't do these shows without their support. So thank you, Comcast Business. Okay, all this week we've been talking about food and restaurants. It's been so amazing. And if you missed any of the conversations, you can go watch them uh, at facebook.com slash how I built this. All the videos are there with Jose Andres and Alice Waters and Daniel Hoom and Christina Tozzi and more. So. I have been waiting all week for today's guest because I refer to this book, um, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, at least three times a week. Her Netflix show is one of the most delighted things, delightful things in the world. You should go check it out because everyone's watching Netflix right now. She's got a new podcast out. It's called Home Cooking, and she's right here. Samina Nostrat, welcome. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. <laughs> um, you are, I guess we should just be, be straight up with everybody. We're like a couple blocks away. We both live in Oakland, California. Totally. We're neighbors. Although I've never seen you on the street. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Well, you know, after this is over for sure. Um, how, how are you doing? How are you doing right now? I've, I've been seeing your posts on Instagram and, and you were on Good Morning America doing some cooking stuff and you've been talking about cooking, but how are you doing in general? right now? Uh, I mean, I go through ups and downs like everyone. I would say I live in a particularly special and like bucolic place. I live on a piece of property where four homes share a huge courtyard and garden. So even though I live by myself, we're still together. So I'm not totally alone. I have a lot of outdoor space. I have a puppy who's crazy, yeah. <laughs> keeps me company. Yes. Um, and I have a lot of nice neighbors. So I feel very lucky. And but also, I go through my own emotional swings. Like last week, I was just really grumpy and angry all week. And uh, this week, I'm doing a little better, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and just a reminder of people, if you've got any questions for Samin or any cooking questions or food questions, we're taking all your questions um, on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. So please ask away. Um, Samin, I heard you on, on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. It, obviously, an NPR show, one of the best shows, such an incredible show. You talked about... Um, just like comfort food. Like I think you mentioned just like making a box of mac and cheese and adding some peas to it. Um, and like, that was just this great meal. It was like a, just a simple, comfortable lunch. And it was so nice to hear because you're a chef and you can make anything you want. <laughs> I know it, everyone, I think everyone really thinks I'm like, or people like me are home just like creating genius, culinary genius all the time. But the truth is, I mean, I also am affected by Oh, I think we lost Samin. Okay. She's gonna reconnect in a moment. Um oh you're back. I'm oh, back. I'm back. <laughs> you're back. I'm good. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't I'm not sure what happened, but yeah, you know, I'm also affected by the shopping limitations and the grocery limitations. And also cooking is work. I mean, it's my actual job, but I think all of us more than ever are realizing how much it goes into feeding ourselves. Even for me, I think I drink, I'm going through so much coffee at home. I only drink one coffee, one cup of coffee a day, yeah, yeah, but yeah. still the, I, it's dawning on me all of the sort of times that I just go and grab a sandwich or a cup of coffee somewhere else. Now all of that's coming out of my own kitchen. So I get tired too. You know, I eat a lot of toast for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's not always like the fantasy, like what I think everybody thinks is happening, but yeah. also there is some joy in the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because I'm finding like, um, like I am cooking, I do all the cooking at home and my, my partner, she does all the laundry and then, um, and, and 
we've got two kids and but it, so there's like a lot just piles of dishes like every after every meal like i go to the kitchen there's just piles of dishes and just the dishwasher is working all the time and i'm constantly cleaning dishes but um i mean there is definitely is something to like there there's something there's like a connection that i think not just me but like millions of people are are kind of making with their with their homes, right? Like we are in our homes. We have to cook. Like we yeah. can't get the sandwich. We can't go to Starbucks. We've got to brew the coffee. Um, we've got a lot of people are baking bread, you know, like, um, I mean, in some ways, like the stuff you write about in this book is, is, is to kind of encourage people to make their own food. Um, and, and in sort of a, sort of a silver lining way, like that's, that's happening right now. Totally. I actually think one of the greatest things that will come out of this is, I think a lot more people will have confidence in the kitchen and feel like they can take care of themselves and they can because now sort of overnight we were all forced to. So people are practicing, which the only thing that makes you a better cook is practice. It's not, you know, fancy tools or like going to some culinary school. It's just practicing. So now that we all have to make meals, you know, multiple times a day on end for ourselves and for the people around us, we are all getting better. The other thing I think is kind of the invisible um, force that helps us become better that a lot of us don't even realize. And this is probably something you can relate to having interviewed so many amazing creative people is constraint. I think total freedom is often overwhelming. You yes. know, when you can have any ingredient, when you can do anything, when you could make any recipe, you don't know where to start. You don't have like a path. But when we are constrained by our space or our ingredients or our time or, you know, what our kids are going to eat or if they're going to lose their minds, you know, right. <laughs> like all of those things help us decide what to make and sort of make better choices within our confinement. And so I actually think if people can become more comfortable at identifying the constraints and working within them, that that also will help later when you go to the farmer's market and you're faced with total abundance. Yeah, totally. And 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 this idea of the paradox of choice, right? Barry Schwartz, who actually lives in Berkeley, he came up with this idea and it's true. It's why like Chipotle works for so many people, right? Because there's a few choices, few options. The the other day I was I was like really wanted a a, a chicken sandwich. There's an amazing chicken place in Oakland that you know, Bake Sale Betty's. Mm -hmm. And I wanted one of the sandwiches and I had rice flour, like rice, like rice crumbs, bread crumbs that I bought at Trader Joe's like a year ago and I found it and I was like, wait, I'm gonna make a fried chicken sandwich with this. And it was great. That's awesome. It wasn't big sale Betty's, but it was, you know. It was good. Well, yeah. I think that's the thing is I, I, we are all learning in a way I'm like, oh, I kind of wrote the guide for this time because the whole point of salt, fat, acid, heat is to teach you how to think outside the bounds of a recipe. And I think what recipes do, and they are necessary, is they, but they make people feel like if they don't have this ingredient, you know, this tool, this specific thing, that they can't make it. And right now it's like the time of substitutions and it's the time of improvisation. So my whole theory as a cook, my whole philosophy, my whole thing with, cook, with teaching people about cooking is think about what role those ingredients and tools are playing and then figure out what else you can use so you don't have to run to the store. How are you getting um, ingredients? I mean, a lot of people are, you know, talking about having a hard time getting butter or flour, eggs, um, you know, wait, a lot of people don't want to wait in line forever at grocery stores. Um, are, do you have any like hacks to just get stuff? <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> I definitely have been waiting in my fair share of lines. Um, but I, let's, I mean, I did have a friend who was ordering online and I said, how did you even get a slot? Cause they're so hard. And she told me that she woke up in the middle of the night, which yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah, I've done that four in the morning. That's how you get your delivery. That's how you get the slot. Yeah. Which I think is so awesome. And so like sad. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing, I mean, and I know that this is tricky, but because people have so much fear, understandably, but in on my street, we share a lot of resources. You know, there's, I know this is definitely not what everyone has, but across the street, for example, 
somebody has chickens and then we have a huge, like we have many fruit trees. So we're just constantly sharing stuff mm. and also cooked food. I live by myself, but when I make a big pot of soup or a big pot of beans or, you know, big lasagna, I'm constantly sharing that. And at first I think there were a lot of questions about if sharing food was safe, right. but it seems, you know, on the research, based on the research that I've read, that this really is not transmitted through food. It's you have to be careful about the container you're using and people wiping off the container once it comes into the house. But um, I, yeah, we're, I'm just sort of, there's a, we get a lot of like yesterday, somebody texted me and said, do you have any cardamom? And I said, yeah, come over. <laughs> so there's a lot more sharing. Are you, and are you kind of like leaving it in front of people's doors and stuff? Yeah, I just leave. Yeah, I just leave stuff out like prepackaged and they, yeah. and I send a message and people come get it. Yeah, I did that with a friend. She has chickens. Um, um, she left eggs in front of her house and I left a uh, half of a roasted leg of lamb that I made. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's great. Um, we're getting tons of questions um, from, from, our, from our viewers. Um, so this is from um, Patricia Morel Act. Um, she's asked. She asks, like, what, like, how, how has your personal cooking changed in, in recent weeks? And like, for example, are you having to change ingredients that you're used to just having? Um, well, I, my own self, feel I have always been a champion of the pantry. And so I had a pretty rich pantry, like a pretty well stocked pantry before. Yeah. So I don't think I don't actually feel like I have changed a ton. I'm not. I I will say like I don't have the plentitude of fresh vegetables that I always have. Yeah. Had historically on hand, and so there's a lot more like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and the kind of stuff that can last a long time that I sort of work through over the course of the week. But the other thing I will say that's been very strange in my life, one of the ways I've been affected is I'm not that hungry. Like I, I have historically been known for my huge appetite <laughs> and the way that the, the coronavirus has like probably emotionally and physically affected me is I don't feel like eating that much right now. Huh. So as much as I cook, I sort of just give stuff away most of the time, but I'm not like drawn to eating. So I'm eating a lot less meat than I normally do. I mean, which is not always even that much, but I think I've only had like chicken once this whole time. So, um, but I, I'm trying to wrap my mind around how I can share substitution information with other people. I've been working on a recipe for cake where you can use whatever you have, you know, but it's hard. Like <laughs> it's hard. I mean, thank God for you because I bought cake flour like six months ago to make a recipe from your book. So I have cake flour. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, here's a question from Mariam Chowdhury Nurani, who's watching from Pakistan. Hi, Mariam. Um, she asks, what is the one cookbook that you cannot live without? Oh, wow. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> so many, right? Uh, I know that's a hard question. I'm like looking at my shelf. Um, Probably the one that I have referred to the most over the years is, is um, The Art of Simple Food by Alice Waters. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll cheat and say all of the Chez Panisse cookbooks. Yeah. Just because that is where I come from as a cook. You know, that's how I learned how to cook. And it's kind of my, those are my sort of guiding lights in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, I'll throw one out. Um, I've been just, aside from your book, which I refer to every week I, it's hard to name one like there's you know debbie madison's book on vegetarian i mean that's a classic right um that's another sort of chez panisse world book um but um modern joffrey like i have been going through the modern joffrey books like like julie and julia like that movie and your book too. <laughs> like i it's, it's so great um like making like veal shanks like things that not veal shanks lamb shanks like things that i you know, just had in the freezer. Okay, here's a question from, uh, this is a good question. I like this question. Um, okay, this is from uh, Marin, Marin Olin Jacob Oviat. Um, she asks, what advice do you have for people who want to bake bread but can't find flour or yeast anywhere? Change your desires. <laughs> 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 so I, I don't know what to tell you about if you can't find flour. I mean, if you're specifically referring to all-purpose flour or bread flour that you can't find, but say you're able to find whole wheat flour, 
There are recipes for 100% whole wheat bread online that are um, really good. We actually just had Stella Parks, a wonderful baker, advising us on our podcast ep on an episode recently. And she has a really soft and tender whole wheat loaf on, on SeriousEats.com. That's really mm -hmm. great. In terms of yeast, I mean... I think a lot of people have yeast that um, are who are hoarding. So look for somebody to borrow from. <laughs> but you can also, you know, it seems daunting, and I myself never wanted to do it. But I have, like, I have over there now my sourdough starter that I feed every day. It took me ten days to get it to come to life, and now I'm able to make really beautiful bread. So if you want to commit to the time commitment, that's a way to sort of um, do it without yeast but then the tricky thing is you have to feed starter flour yeah. so it's complicated yeah. and and i saw that like you had never done it before like this is the no i've never done it before yeah. because there's so much good bread i know so many wonderful bakers i just figured why would i like undertake this crazy intimidating thing yeah. that takes so much time but now i have endless time to stand there and baby my dough so i've started doing it and it's actually a really wonderful way to pass the day <laughs> yeah there and marion olin um there's a great cookbook by Amy Chaplin called Whole Foods Cooking Every Day. And um, she has a bunch of wheatless uh, recipes, flourless recipes for bread that use rice and other things. And it's a really cool book. So I would recommend. Oh, that's cool. that. yeah. yeah. That's awesome. There's also a bread. Uh, now you just re reminded me, my friend Josie Baker, he has a recipe for something called adventure bread, which is made entirely out of like chia seeds and flax seeds and nuts. Ooh. And it holds together. It's a gluten-free loaf that is really delicious and sliceable and toastable. And some of the, a lot of those things you can get through Amazon, like mm -hmm. chia, like I, I got some chia seeds through Amazon. And so thank you for that question. Um, This is, um, this is a question from Yvette Kane. Um, she's like, she's asking, how can I make a batch of breakfast muffins without them deflating so much after they are cooked and also, and still come back to room temperature? Is there like a water bath way to, to, to make that happen? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, breakfast muffins are, are breakfast deflating. Muffins, like mostly eggy. Is that why she's concerned about the deflation? Is that possibly? That, uh, that sounds right. Yeah. I think I think it's the deflation is part of the joy. <laughs> you know, that's what happens. <laughs> that's what happens when you cook eggs is they puff up and then they deflate. That's what happens with souffles and stuff. So um, I think maybe just shift what your goals of or your like idea of beauty is. <laughs> Yeah, totally. <laughs> but if you are, if it's more about the temperature and you're worried about it being cold, you can absolutely just pop that back into an oven and just heat it up. You don't even need the water bath. Yeah. But um, who? A little deflation never hurt anyone, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. All right, Jackie, Levi uh, Jackie Levine or Levine. I um, hope I'm pronouncing that right, Jackie. Um, she she's asks. She says we found ourselves with a lot of salmon and cabbage, presumably frozen salmon. Um, any quick and easy advice for salmon, for those ingredients, salmon and cabbage? Yes. Okay. Cabbage lately, I've been doing this thing where um, I take the whole head of cabbage and I slice it into in, slices, maybe an inch and a half thick and roast them on a sheet pan with um, whatever. So whatever fe flavors I'm feeling. So the original way I had it, someone made it for me. He put a ton of butter and like coriander seed and poured some white wine over it and roasted it in the oven at about 300 degrees for maybe an hour and a half. And what happens is I think we forget, we consider cabbage this like really boring, I don't know, like depression era thing. Yeah. But, but if cabbage spends time cooking, it turns into something completely different. It gets yeah. so sweet and silky and tender and wants to melt in your mouth. And mm. so I have been making that and with all sorts of different flavors. I made one that was like kind of Japanese-y with rice wine yeah. and sesame seeds and soy sauce that was super good. And I think you can reflect whatever's happening on the cabbage on the salmon. Usually I cook salmon at an even lower temperature, but you can kind of make a compromise and stick yeah. both in the oven, you know, on separate trays. The salmon will take a lot less time than the cabbage. So maybe start the cabbage and then do slow cooked salmon. And if you end up doing soy sauce and sesame seeds and rice wine, that's what you can drizzle over your salmon too. We are taking your questions for Samin Nostrat um, on Facebook, on YouTube and Twitter. So please ask away. The other thing about cabbage is um, raw cabbage is really high in vitamin C. Like it's a really nutritious. Really? Yeah, 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 it is. I had no idea. Yeah, it is. <laughs> 
And and yeah, like, I mean, cabbage. I also love cabbage slaw, but cabbage there's slaw, right? only it's... so much cabbage slaw one person can eat. That's true, but it lasts for a while. Like it, I just, I got, I had a cabbage, and I just drizzled some um, white balsamic vinegar, and um, I made a little, I made mayonnaise from your book. And uh, I keep holding this book up; it's so great. I know, I'm like, I know you're like a commercial. I'm your agent. I'm your agent. <laughs> this this book is just essential. Um, and I I put some mayonnaise in it, and salt and pepper, and some ca shredded carrots. It was so good. It's so. Oh, that it's, sounds so it's good. It's like that that. That's got the fat and acid and salt. It's so good. So cabbage. I think also the other thing about cabbage that's really delightful when it's raw is that crunch. Yeah. And a lot of what happens, what I what's been happening in my house right lately is I've been eating a lot of very soft foods, partly <laughs> because they're comforting and partly because a lot of the stuff that we have and keep in our fridges and our pantries. You have to cook it a really long time until it's soft and tender. Yeah. So then you kind of for, like I have forgotten the delight of crunch. So I think cabbage, carrots, all of those things like a cucumber salad, anything that's fresh and crunchy is a nice relief from yeah. all the soft. And Jackie also asked about salmon. What I mean, oh. yeah. Oh, so I think for the salmon, what I would what I would do is the um I do a slow cooked salmon where I put it on a sheet pan on a piece of parchment skin side down. Filet. Yeah, the whole filet, you can stick the whole thing in there. And the nice thing is, is the leftovers are really nice cold and at room temperature, but just do the whole big piece. And I stick it in the oven typically at like 225 or 250. But if you wanna just cook the cabbage and the salmon at the same time, it'll be fine at 300 degrees also. The salmon will take less time than the cabbage will. So get your cabbage started and then um, if you're doing the roast inversion and then um, and then get that salmon in there and you'll know it's done when the pieces uh, kind of flake apart when you try to touch them. That's yeah. how that's because it doesn't really look the same as when we cook salmon on the stove. Yeah. It kind of stays translucent. It's much more about the texture. Yeah, that's my total go to. Um, and uh, I mean, just that salmon in the oven 225 for like 40 to 50 minutes i take it out that's that's from your book it's so great i love it yeah um, and you can eat it warm you can eat it on a salad you can put yeah. it in a sandwich you could you could do it in any like <laughs> yeah um i love this question it's from lucas uh matthias i think i'm hoping i'm pronouncing that right lucas um thank you samin for being such a positive human um thank you to for me too, Samin. Um, when you get, um, when you're, when this crisis is over, uh, what dish are you going to order at a restaurant that you miss? Oh man, I, <laughs> my favorite restaurant is a Korean restaurant nearby that um, makes a uh, hot tofu soup in a, like a stone bowl. I know that restaurant. And, yeah, it's so good. And they also have just um, this, these like thin kimchi pancakes that are so crispy and delicious. I, I I probably actually, I haven't really been ordering any takeout. I just, it hasn't even occurred to me. But what I miss is all of the kinds of foods that taste totally different than what I make for myself. Yeah. You know, I rely a lot on olive oil and lemon and vinegar. So kind of my food almost all tastes in that Mediterranean, you know, flavor palette, which yeah. is fine and delicious. But I look forward to eating stuff from other parts of the world. Yesterday, I was really craving Mexican food. I think mm. I'm going to probably make some beans in the yeah. next day or two and maybe yeah. some tortilla and stuff. Um, I love that. Okay, this is from Susie Wyshak. Um, she says she's got like eight-ish year old Zatar spice mix that still smells <laughs> good. But would you be concerned about using it? Oh, no, I wouldn't be concerned about using it. I would taste it. The only thing that would maybe have gone wrong is that the sesame seeds may have turned rancid. Also, yeah. hi, Susie. Uh, <laughs> I know you. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I think as long as it still tastes and smells good, it's totally fine. If you've kept it in a cool, dark place, there's totally a chance that the sesame seeds are still fine. Um, this is from Kevin Lindsay. Um, he's getting a lot of chard in his delivery, so I'm assuming he, he's part of a CSA, which is a great way to get food if you if that's available where you live. Um, we just started getting a box on, and it's awesome. They just whatever is available, they throw in there. He's getting a lot of chard. Um, uh, the stock is kind of like rhubarb. What about making a dessert with chard stock? <laughs> I've never heard the chard stems. Yeah. Uh, 
You know what? That's kind of amazing. I've never thought I didn't that that question did not go where I thought it was gonna go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you really threw me a curveball, Kevin. Um okay. I have ne it's never occurred to me to go sweet with charred stems, but I suppose you totally could. I don't know, you know, the thing about rhubarb is that it's so sour, and so that really invites sugar. Whereas to me, charred stems are much um milder and there's I don't really taste a sourness when I try them. Yeah. So I do think you could dry a cake or something, but there's a really cool recipe for a rhubarb upside down, or it's like a rhubarb cake that um the rhubarb sits on top of on bonappetit.com that you could try with the with the charred stems. Mm -hmm. What I like to do with charred stems, like the little yummy treat that I do, is I save them until I have a big pile and then I blanch them just until they're tender in boiling water and then I deep fry them. So you could just batter batter them with buttermilk and flour and yeah. fry them, or you could cover them with like you know egg and breadcrumb and fry them in a pan, and then they're kind of like little French fries. They're they're really yeah. delicious. Oh my god! Well, yeah. So so charred, sweet charred. I mean, Tom Brady makes ice cream out of avocados. So you it's know, true. I mean, right? there are no rules anymore. No yeah. Rules. <laughs> um, all right. Here's a question from uh, Jennifer Klein of uh, Valina or Vaina: um, Butter versus olive oil when sautéing. Well, oh, uh, I don't think there's a versus. I'm a, I'm into both. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's more about making the decision that's right for that moment and right for that dish. So I really feel like fat, the fat that you start with in a in a dish, determines the flavor, the final flavor of the dish. So when I I choose butter when I want something to be extra rich and really to taste sort of more northern European or yeah. French. And I choose olive oil when I want things to taste Italian, when I want things to taste like they come from the Mediterranean, you know, and then I extend that to even things like I, when I'm making Indian food, I use ghee. When I make Korean food, I use neutral oil or sesame oil. So I really do suggest choosing the fat based on the flavor that you're after. All right, this is from Jennifer Gustin, favorite chicken thigh recipe. She doesn't specify, specify whether it's boneless or skinless, but let's say it's a bone in skin on chicken thighs. What's your favorite? Okay. I think my very favorite thing to do with chicken thighs is something that um, I kind of like, I derived it from a few different traditions. So I call it um, conveyor belt chicken because my friend said it was so good. He would eat, he wanted a conveyor belt of it to his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, you know, called chicken under a brick or po pollo al matone, pollo al matone, which just means um, you flip that chicken over, you use a knife to take that bone out. And once you have a boneless thigh with the skin on, you cook it in a pan, like ideally a cast iron pan with a little bit of fat and a weight on top. So that mm -hmm. could be another heavy pan with a piece of foil underneath to press down on the skin side. And I cook it kind of like medium low heat. You know, it should take total about 12 or 15 minutes and almost entirely skin side down. And so that combination of low heat and the weight help render all of the fat out of the skin. So it turns into this like crispy sort of shard on top. And then you flip it over finish cooking it and you get this wonderful thing. And what I love about that is, is he uses thighs rather than breasts, you know, much less expensive, much generally more available. Yeah. And also usually dark meat takes, you know, anywhere upwards of 45 minutes to cook through. And this is a really quick and easy way to do it. And you just salt it and that's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. It's to me so natural. I didn't even mention. So I salt it, take the bone out and then cook it. Wow. <laughs> Awesome. I love it. Um, I, I made a great um, recipe from Mater Joffrey's book, a go in chicken um, curry using thighs. And it was incredible. Oh, so good. Um, so, I mean, so many great ways to use. Um, um, I think thighs are the most versatile. Yeah. They're yeah. the, like, if I ever buy parts, I always buy chicken thighs. Yeah. Um, all right. What? Um, with so many questions coming in. Um, I could keep you on here for the next few days. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, what is, this is from uh, Usha Shanmugan. Um, she writes in, do you think that for you personally, um, this this moment is going to change the way you cook after this is over? Um, that's so interesting. I have been thinking a lot about that. I, I, 
haven't noticed a huge shift in the way that I cook. I think I've always cooked a little bit with like just whatever I have and whatever's around. I think the changes for me are going to have, well, what has been noticeable is it's changed the way I eat. I mean, when I am hungry, I, I, um, I'm much better about using everything up and I've always been a champion of that and like an advocate for that, but I haven't always necessarily practiced what I preached probably in large part because I'm gone a lot. So I think yeah. one part of it is just being home. I'm here to eat all the leftovers. <laughs> yeah. Another part of it too, is it's changing the way I'm thinking about what it is that I want to put out in the world and what and how I would like to encourage people to cook and sort of teach people and guide people in the future. And I think, um, in a way, I think this is gonna make, you know, the audience much more receptive to like humble, simple things yeah. than, right. you know, a focus on sort of like Instagrammable perfection, <laughs> you know? So, but I, I sort of am, am watching with great interest. I, I will say I'm so pleased at how much people are cooking and how much pride they're taking in it and enjoyment. And that makes me really happy to watch because all I feel like there's so many problems in our food system that it's so fragile and that's being proven to us right now, you know, like getting food is really, there's just like gaps in the supply chain. Yeah. There are entire small farms that are probably going to like shut down after this, you know? Um, and I think such a big part of supporting our food chain and investing in it is cooking at home. Because when we cook at home, we want to buy stuff. We have a relationship to the people we're buying stuff from. You're seeing that in CSAs right now, right? Like you can go to the farmer's market, you know your farmer and you feel really supported by them and they're feeling supported by you. And when in a time when it's hard to get fresh vegetables, that's so important, you know. So I, I think for me, it's, I, it's, it's a little bit less about the specific recipes and much more. I'm just watching what's happening yeah. to us as a culture. All right. We're going to get to two more quick um, food specific questions. This is from Kimberly Cowens. What is a great collard greens thing to do with collard greens? Okay. To me, the only thing to do with collard greens is to cook them for a really long time. Uh, with some juicy liquid, a little bit of acidic liquid. I think historically you could use like apple cider vinegar or wine. You could even put beer in there. Um, so I would start my pan with an onion and then, you know, get that onion. If you eat meat, you could use bacon fat or lard or even like, eat a little piece of bacon in there too and get that sort of cooked and brown and delicious and then throw those greens in there, mm. add some liquid. I would do water and maybe vinegar and just cook it for a really, 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 really long time until it's all the way soft and something happens in that transformation. It turns into this sweet, delicious other thing that's incredibly satisfying. So, and also, uh, you know, what Southerners call pot liquor is all of those juices at the bottom. And that's what you want to dip your cornbread in. That's what you want to spoon over your beans. So collard greens to me are um, so nourishing and so delicious, but like I pretty much just stick to the classic method. <laughs> yeah. And collard greens, super nutritious. I think high in iron and like- High in iron, iron, so yeah. much iron. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. Last food question, John Fitzgerald, he's got frozen ahi tuna steaks. What, what do, you do you do? Okay. Yeah. So you frost them first. <laughs> and then what I would do is I would make tuna confit, which is basically mm -hmm. a home version of your own preserved tuna. And then you have these beautiful pieces of fish to do several different things with over the course of many days. So to do that, you would use olive oil or some other neutral oil and bring it up. You don't want it to be super warm. You just, you want it to be, um, I'm sure only warm enough so that when you add a garlic clove to it, just the tiniest bubbles emerge. You don't want any sizzle, nothing, nothing like that. So I would defrost my fish, season it with salt. If you want to put some other seasonings on there, fennel seed, chili flake, you can do that. And then you gently bring up kind of a lot of oil. You need about an inch in your pot. So you could use a small pot to um, decrease the amount of total oil that you have to use and just cook one piece of fish at a time. 
but uh, you're gonna need to then stick this, like you kind of slip your fish in and you let it gently cook. So this is called confiting, which is sort of like preserving in fat. Um, and you cook it to whatever doneness you like. I like it to be about medium so that it's, um, you know, more cooked on the outside and still quite pink in the middle. You pull it out and let it cool in the fridge until, so it, until it's all the way cool. And then the fun part comes, you get to shred it into pieces with your hands mm. <laughs> and you get to make whatever you want. So what, probably the two most delicious, like classic ways of using it. One is to make um, something called tuna, tono of fagioli, like tuna and white beans. So you have this beautiful pile of this poached tuna, and then you can make a pile of beans. I think you need something acidic in there. So I would make, your mouth looks like it's watering, guy. It's, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm dying here. I'm dying. I would slice onion, slice red onion or whatever onion you have, lightly pickle it in vinegar. If you have any fresh herbs, add that on top. And you get this like classic Italian countryside dish to have with a glass of wine and a piece of crusty bread. Or you could turn it into like a really nice tuna niçoise salad or a tuna sandwich, like which is what I love to do and mix it with, you know, mayonnaise, whether it's homemade or not. And then whatever kind of flavorings you want, like basil, marinated vegetables. And it's just like so oily and delicious. And you can keep the tuna in the fridge in that oil once it's cool. The oil will help preserve it. And it's also really delicious. And you can use that oil to make the vinaigrette that you serve with your salad. Wow. I think that's that's what's going to happen tonight with that <laughs> Ayu tuna. Um, so I mean, stand by. I just want to Shout out to a couple of people watching. Um, Linda Cucurulo in Hingham. I think that's in Massachusetts. Oh, Adriana Compagnoni from New Jersey. Sarah Turner in Colorado. Pau Carpio in Austin, Texas. Alexand Alexandra Lomas in Los Gatos. Calpana in Boston. Karina Marcella in LA. Stephanie Coleman in New Jersey. Kim Smith in Virginia. Tara Kristoff in Dallas. Tabitha Yafosua in Southern Indiana. Alicia Bettencourt Wigington in Bentonville, Arkansas. So many other names. Thank you all for watching. Um, this week has been so incredible. We've had, of course, Samin on and Jose Andres and Alice Waters and Daniel Hume and Christina Tozzi and Kyle Connaughton. You can see all those conversations about food at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash how I built this. Just click on videos. We're also posting those on the NPR YouTube page. Um, I will be back here next week. We're going to talk, uh, we're talking about business and building resilience at a very, you know, challenging time and how businesses are thinking creatively. I'm going to be talking to the founders of Allbirds, Tim Brown and Joey Zwillinger next week. Also, Stuart Butterfield from Slack is going to happen next Friday. So join us here next Wednesday, April 29th, 12 Eastern, and then Friday, May 1st, 12 Eastern with Stuart Butterfield. We'll announce those on the podcast. If you missed any of these conversations, again, you can find them on um, on our Facebook page, but we're putting excerpts of all these conversations on our podcast. So if you're a subscriber to How I Built This, you will be able to hear these conversations there. We've got a, an all new episode of How I Built This on Monday with the founder of Fitbit, James Park. Um, once again, thank you to everybody for watching all this week. It's been so fun and so incredible to hear all these stories about how people in the food and restaurant industry are really, are really transforming um, the way they do what they do and also working to help feed people around around the country. Samin Nosrat, um, author of Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, um, the new podcast, Home Cooking. Thank you so much for being with us. It's just yeah. been such a joy having you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so fun. Everyone's questions are so good. Yeah.